The Gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him everything was made, and without Him not one thing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man, sent from God, whose name was John. He came as an eyewitness to testify about the light, so that everyone would believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The real light that shines on everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his own, yet his own people did not accept him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They were born not of blood, or of the desire of the flesh, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory he has as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him. He cried out, This was the one I spoke about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me because he existed before me. For out of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son, who is close to the Father's side, has made him known. Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh God, you saw the need of our darkness. You saw our sin, and it grieved you. And so, in your eternal plan, you came to us. You became one of us, and lived among us, so that you could take upon yourself the consequences of our sin, even become our sin, so that you could go to the cross where you would suffer the penalty we deserve for our rebellion, and so that you could be raised from the dead to prove your power over sin and death and to free us from our bondage to sin and death, and to bring us into a holy and righteous fellowship with yourself. We thank you that you inspired your Apostle John to record for us what it was that happened in your Incarnation. And we ask now that as we meditate in these words, that we will hear you speak to our hearts, that we will know the gift of faith, and that we will be empowered to faith, to believe, to trust in your grace. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Matthew and Luke, in their narratives of the birth of Jesus, focus on the story of the birth and the events around the birth. There is interwoven into their stories, into their narratives, the spiritual truths behind them. We've talked about the name that was given to the 
boy conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary, by the boy that Joseph was to give the name Jesus, and considered that that name was given him specifically because it is a fulfillment of his purpose among us. That Emmanuel, God come to us, came to forgive his people of their sins. John takes a completely different approach to this event. He doesn't actually at all tell us about Mary or Joseph. He doesn't tell us about the shepherds or the wise men. He doesn't tell us about the guest room where there was no room for them, so they were given a place to sleep among the animals where the baby Jesus would be laid in a manger. Instead, John focuses on what is happening or what happened in the spiritual world around this event that we celebrate in this season of Christmas. And as we look at the beginning of John's Gospel, there are three words, three terms, that help us focus on what it is that God has done for us. The word, word, the word light, and the word flesh are these three terms that lead us to a deeper understanding of what God has done for us. So let's look at those three terms. The first is Word. The Gospel begins with, in the beginning was the Word. Just as a little aside here, there's a phrase that uh, we read in Galatians that uh, at the right time God sent forth His Son born of a woman, and there's been a lot of consideration about what the right time means. I would suggest that one of the pieces of the right time has to do with this word. It's not a term that we have in the English language, and so we have translated the Greek word logos with our English term word. In the Greek language, there's another word that would be simply translated word uh, in terms of all of the little groups of letters that we gather together to create a sentence. This word, logos, is different. And I think one of the pieces that uh, helps give understanding to the right time that God sent forth His Son at the right time has to do with the fact that Greek was the language of commerce and that there would have been no other time in history when this term could have been applied to God. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And the sense there is not just a single group of letters that makes up a word, but the sense there that is that this is all of the counsel and knowledge of God. I suppose it's similar to the broad sense of the Old Testament word Torah. But here, this Greek term, logos, is applied directly to God. And it says to us that this entity, this being that is called logos, already was when our time began. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. So this is a pre-existent being. And as we walk through who the Logos is, we'll see that He is Creator. And so even time is His creation. But clearly indicated to us that he is pre-existent. And then we find that this word, this logos, was both with God and was God. That doesn't mean that he's not God anymore, 
But it does mean that when our time began, this relationship already existed. And so we put that into our understanding of a term that, that we have applied to uh, try to find some kind of language around who God is, the Trinity. And that here we have the first and second persons of the Trinity, that they are together, so the Word was with God, but they are also both God, not two gods, as we learn in our understanding of Trinity, of the Trinity, but that uh, while they are one God, they are persons of the one God. And so the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that's where we begin. In order to, uh, in order to understand what it was that happened on that first Christmas day, what it is that we celebrate during this season, begins with an understanding that there is a pre-existent being, a being that we are giving the label Logos to, and so that we are understanding that He is the fullness of all that He is, that He is the full substance of all knowledge and wisdom that He is with God, that He is God. And then as we continue to read on, that He is Creator. Through Him, through this Logos, everything was made, and without Him, not one thing was made that has been made. And it's important for us to understand the dynamics here that what happens in, our, in this event that we call Christmas has to do with the being that spoke or that breathed all of creation into existence. It's, it's mind-boggling, it's mind-blowing. That we, but we need to begin there because it, it, it is this entity that we call God, that here we call the Word who was with God and was God. And then we find what it is that He has done for the creation that He created. The Word. The second term that we find related to the word is the term light. And what we find then is that this word comes to us and that he comes to us as light that shines on everyone. So there's some, there's some implications here that is, that's important for us to grab onto. Why would God come to shine light unless there is a darkness that needs to be exposed? And this brings us then face to face with our reality. Why did the pre-existent Logos, why did the creator of the universe Come to expose our darkness. Because our darkness needs exposing, I suppose. And as we look then at, 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 at how the Holy Spirit revealed to John what happened in the incarnation in the birth of Jesus, we find that, the, that this light who, is, who comes to shine on everyone is not recognized by His creation. The world was made through Him, John wrote, yet the world did not recognize Him. And there's the problem. 
we have substituted any number of things for God. Ultimately, we substitute ourselves. All we see is ourselves. And we live in the I. And we live in selfishness. And we satisfy the passions and lusts of our natural dead selves. And we live in darkness. And the light came to shine in our darkness and we did not recognize him. But, John tells us, there are some who did. And here's the promise that is going to be fulfilled in the actual coming, or let's put it in the past tense since it's already happened. The promise that was fulfilled and is fulfilled for each one of us in this coming is this. That those who believe in his name, those who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. So again, some implications. Our broken human condition is that we are separated from God. We are alienated from God. Scripture says that we are dead in our transgressions and sin. But when we receive the one who comes, the Logos, the light, when we believe him, put our trust in him and what he does for us, then there's a transformation that God gives to us. He actually gives us a right. The right to be called the children of God, to become the children of God. And the alienation is put aside. And, re and there's a restoration. Scripture often uses the word reconciliation, which is a friendship kind of term. Here it's a family kind of term. It's about adoption. That we are outside of the family, but when we receive the one who came, when we believe in him, that is, put our trust in him and what he has done for us, then we are adopted. We are brought into the family of God. And not only are we brought in, but we are given the right to be in the family of God. So what is it then that the Word, the Logos, the Light did in order to make this effective for us. And this takes us then to our third term, the term flesh. It's a powerful statement. And it is exactly what happened when Mary conceived. When the nine months of gestation happened and the birth happened. But it was at the conception that this really happened. The Word became flesh. Now this is a powerful term that's, that speaks volumes in the face of ancient Greek religion. Often in, in Greek religion we find that the gods would come down and impersonate either animals or humans, even interact with them as though they were human. But there's always an understanding in Greek religion, what we call Greek mythology or Roman mythology, that that was simply an impersonation. But what the Holy Spirit revealed to John and John recorded for us and the Holy Spirit preserved for us is this incredible truth that the one who created takes on the form of the created. That the Word, the Logos, who was in the beginning, who was with God and who was God, through whom everything that was made was made, became 
human flesh. It's not an impersonation. It's not a kind of putting on as a putting on a mask. It is the actual becoming flesh. And so we have the term incarnation from the Latin word uh, for flesh, carne. He becomes human meat. He becomes, he became human flesh. And then John, reflecting on what this was about, he tells us that this one, and he does name him in verse 17, Jesus Christ, that this one is full of grace and truth. He's full of grace and truth. Why is grace even a, a, a need? Why is, it, why is grace a part of this conversation? Because we cannot come to life on ourselves. We are dead, and the dead can do nothing for him or herself. We are separated, and we cannot heal the separation. We are rebellious, and the only inclination that we have is to continue to rebel, to continue to disbelieve, to not recognize the one who came. And he, but he comes with grace, which means that he is extending to the dead life. He is extending to the rebellious, a bringing back into fellowship. And this, he says, is the truth. It is true, which means then that we can count on it that we can put our faith in it, that we can believe it, that we can trust that what He does for us, He does. And He will fulfill His promise. The Word became flesh is full of grace and truth. And then we have like we're just stacking on top, and one of the things that I, 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 ta I taught um, English language arts for many years, and as we would look at literature, we would, we would look for things that author would repeat, and, and certainly as we look at the scriptures, uh, and, and we try to find in scriptures those nuggets that uh, we really need to hang on to, we look for repetition, and, and we find it here, uh, as we continue to read through our our verses from John chapter 1, we see not only that the word that became flesh was full of grace and truth, but that out of his fullness we all receive grace upon grace. Three times here we have the word grace. And we find in that word, really the character and purpose. Why did the Word, who was in the beginning, who was with God and was God and through whom all things were made, why did the Creator of the universe, why did the light come? Why did the Word become flesh? Because we are in desperate need of His grace. And He comes to us, giving us that as a free gift. It is the nature then of God to be gracious. And He extends to us this grace as a gift, so that in believing that He did indeed go to the cross to take upon Himself our sin and our death, that He did suffer our consequences for our rebellion, but that He was victorious over sin and death, and that He rose again from the dead. And as we put our confidence in this gift, then we receive His grace. 
and all of God's riches are extended to us at Christ's expense. It's a neat little acrostic for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And it is the meaning and purpose for the season. You know, we've been asked regularly to remember the reason for the season. And yes, it is about the celebration of the birth of Jesus. But the birth of Jesus has a deep and powerful meaning and purpose. It is not just for God to come to be a good teacher. It is not just for God to come and be a miracle worker. It is not just to come, God to come and, and give us some kind of uh, fulfillment or purpose in this life. But it is for God to come to be one of us so that a perfect one of us to take upon himself the consequences of our sin. Die in our place. Be raised to life as the firstborn of, cre of creation and resurrection to extend to us, in essence, to trade with us, to give us the forgiveness of sin. To declare us not guilty even though we are. And to bring us into the family of God. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, what a wonderful gift it is that you have given to us. Of Jesus who came to us in the flesh full of grace Grant, O oh Father, that we would hear the word and receive the gift of faith, that we might receive and believe in Jesus and receive his grace. Receive each for us your riches, the forgiveness of sin and the adoption into your family, that we might inherit eternal life. We ask in the precious name of the Word who became flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord,